Now my charms are all o'erthrown. From the Tempest Epilogue by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Caitlin Cooper Now my charms are all o'erthrown, And what strength I have is mine own, Which is most faint now, tis true. I must be here confined by you, Or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dictum got, And pardon the deceiver, Dwell in this bare island by your spell, But release me from my bands With the help of your good hands. Gentle breath of yours my sails must fill, Or else my project fails, Which was to please. Now I want spirits to enforce, Art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. End of Now My Charms Are All O'erthrown From the Tempest Epilogue This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank, from the Merchant of Venice, Act Five, Scene One, by William Shakespeare, recorded for LibriVox.org, by Michael Dowling. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patterns of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of decay Doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Come, ho, and wake Diana with a hymn, With sweetest touches pierce your mistress' ear, And draw her home with music. I am never merry when I hear sweet music. The reason is your spirits are attentive, For do but note a wild and wanton herd, A race of youthful and unhandled colts, Fetching mad bounds, bellowing and neighing loud, Which is the hot condition of their blood, if they but hear perchance a trumpet sound, or any air of music touch their ears, you shall perceive them make a mutual stand, their savage eyes turned to a modest gaze, by the sweet power of music. Therefore the poet did feign that Orpheus drew trees, stones, and floods, since not so stockish, hard, and full of rage, but music for the time doth change his nature. A man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. Mark the music. End of How Sweet the Moonlight Sleeps Upon This Bank From the Merchant of Venice, Act Five, Scene One. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Rosalind's Epilogue from As You Like It, Act Five, Epilogue, by William Shakespeare, recorded for LibriVox.org by Leslie Coons. It is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome than to see the lord the prologue. If it be true that good wine needs no bush, tis true that a good play needs no epilogue. Yet to good wine they do use good bushes, and good plays prove the better by the help of good epilogues. What a case am I in, then, that am neither a good epilogue, nor cannot insinuate with you in the behalf of a good play? I am not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. My way is to conjure you. And I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering none of you hates them, 
that between you and the women the play may please. If I were a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breaths that I defied not. And, I am sure, as many have good beards or good faces, or sweet breaths will, for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. End of Rosalind's Epilogue from As You Like It, Act 5, Epilogue. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a dagger which I see before me, from Macbeth, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare, recorded for LibriVox.org, by David Lawrence. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still, and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs us to mine eyes. Now o'er the one half world nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale hectate's offerings, and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel the wolf, whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides toward his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate at my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time, which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he lives, words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done, the bell invites me, hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. End of Is This a Dagger Which I See Before Me From Macbeth, Act 2, Scene 1 This recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, September 2008
supremacy and sway when they are bound to serve, love, and obey? Why are our bodies soft and weak and smooth, unapt to toil and trouble in the world, but that our soft conditions and our hearts should well agree with our external parts? Come, come, you froid and unable worms. My mind hath been as big as one of yours, my heart as great, my reason haply more to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws, our strength as weak, our weakness past compare, that seeming to be most which we indeed least are. Then veil your stomachs, for it is no boot, and place your hands below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please, my hand is ready. May it do him ease. End of Fie, Fie, Unknit That Threatening Unkind Brow From The Taming of the Shrew, Act 5, Scene 2 This recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Think Not I Love Him, from As You Like It, Act 3, Scene 5, by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leslie Coombs. Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy. Yet he talks well. What care I for words? Yet words do well when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. It is a pretty youth. Not very pretty, but sure, he's proud, and yet his pride becomes him. He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion, and faster than his tongue did make offense, his eye did heal it up. He's not very tall, yet for his years he's tall. His leg is but so-so, and yet tis well. There was a pretty redness in his lip a little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. T'was just the difference between the constant red and mingled damask. There be some women, Sylvius, had they marked him in parcels, as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not. Yet I have more cause to hate him than to love him, for what had he to do to chide at me? He said my eyes were black, and my hair black, and now I am remembered, scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one. A mittens is no quittance. I'll write to him a very taunting letter, and thou shalt bear it. Wilt thou, Sylvius? End of Think Not I Love Him From As You Like It, Act 3, Scene 5 This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is a kind of character from Measure for Measure, Act One, Scene One, by William Shakespeare, recorded for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama. Angelo, there is a kind of character in thy life that to the observer doth thy history fully unfold. Thyself and thy belongings are not thine own so proper as to waste thyself upon thy virtues, they on thee. Heaven doth with us as we with torches do, not light them for themselves. For if our virtues did not go forth of us, to all alike as if we had them not. Spirits are not finely touched, but to fine issues, nor nature never lends the smallest scruple of her excellence, but, like a thrifty goddess, she determines herself the glory of her creditor, both thanks and news. But I do bend my speech to one that can my part in him advertise. Hold therefore, Angelo. In our remove, be thou at full ourself. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. Old Aeschylus, though first in question, is thy secondary. Take thy commission. End of There is a Kind of Character From Measure for Measure, Act 1, Scene 1 This recording is in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow From Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 5 By William Shakespeare Recorded for LibriVox.org By David Fetterman She should have died hereafter There would have been a time for such a word Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. End of Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow from Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 5. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Fetterman. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. From Hamlet, Act One, Scene Two, read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self slaughter. O oh God, O oh God, a weary, stale flat and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world fie on t oh fie fie tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed things rank and grows in nature possess it merely that it should come to this but two months dead they not so much not two so excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven and visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month let me not think on t. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which you followed my poor father's body, like now be all tears, why she, even she, oh heaven, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with mine uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left a flushing of her gullet eyes she married o oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets it is not nor it cannot come to good but break my heart for i must hold my tongue end of monologue oh that this too too solid flesh would melt from Hamlet, Act One, Scene Two. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ernst Patinama. Think not I love him, though I ask for him, from as you like it. Act Three, Scene Five, by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Annabella Leone. Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy, yet he talks well. But what care I for words? Yet 
Words do well when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. It is a pretty youth, not very pretty, but sure he's proud, and yet his pride becomes him. He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion, and faster than his tongue did make offence, his eye did heal it up. He is not very tall, yet for his years he's tall. His leg is but so-so, and yet is well. There was a pretty redness in his lip, a little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. Was just the difference betwixt the constant red and mingled damask. There be some women, Silvius, had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part I love him not, nor hate him not, and yet have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what had he to do to chide at me? He said, Mine eyes were black and my hair black, and now I am remembered scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one, omittance is no quittance. I'll write to him a very taunting letter, and thou shalt bear it, wilt thou, Silvius? End of Think Not I Love Him, Though I Ask for Him from As You Like It, Act 3, Scene 5. This recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annabella Leone, Blackpool, England. Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs from Richard II, Act Three, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare, recorded for LibriVox.org by Anna Chessest. No matter where, of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills. And yet, not so, for what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our bowling brooks. And nothing can we call our own but death, and that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humored thus, comes at the last, and with a little pin bores through his castle wall, and farewell king. Cover your heads, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends, Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? End of Let's Talk of Graves, of Worms, and Epitaphs from Richard II, Act Three, Scene Two. This recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
It must be by his death, and for my part. From Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jerry Dixon. It must be by his death, and for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves weary walking. Crown him, that, and then I grant we put a sting in him, that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affection swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face, but when he once attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend, so Caesar may, then lest he may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is augmented, would run to these in these extremities, and therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would as his kind grow mischievous, and kill him in the shell. End of It Must Be By His Death and For My Part From Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene One, by William Shakespeare This recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida. Till I have no wife, I had nothing in France. From All's Well That Ends Well, Act Three, Scene Two, by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Annabella Leone. Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Nothing in France, until he has no wife. Thou shalt have none, Lucien. None in France, then thou hast all again. Poor Lord, is I that chased thee from thy country and exposed those tender limbs of thine to the event of the non-sparing war? And is it I that drive thee from the sportive court where thou wast shot at with fair eyes to be the mark of smoky muskets? O oh, you leaden messengers that ride upon the violent speed of fire, fly with false aim. Move the still piecing air that sings with piercing. Do not touch my lord. Whoever shoots at him, I set him there. Whoever charges on his forward breast, I am the caitiff that do hold him to it, and, though I kill him not, I am the cause his death was so affected. Were I met the raven lion when he roared with sharp constraint of hunger, better twere that all the miseries which nature owes were mine at once. No, come thou home, Lucien, whence honour but of danger wins a scars oft it loses all. I will be gone. My being here it is that holds thee hence. Shall I stay here to do it? No, no, although the air of paradise did found the house, and angels officed all, I will be gone. That pitiful rumour may report my flight to consolate thine ear. Come, night, end day, for with the dark, poor thief, I'll steal away. End of Till I Have No Wife, I Have Nothing in France, from All's Well That Ends Well, Act 3, Scene 2. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annabella Leone, Blackpool, England. Queen Mab from Romeo and Juliet Act 1, Scene 4 
by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Artos. Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She is the fairest midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomies athwart men's noses as they lie asleep. Her wagon spokes made of long spider's legs, a cover of the wings of grasshoppers, the traces of the smallest spider's web, the collars of the moonshine's watery beams, her whip of cricket's bone, the lash of film, her wagoner a small grey-coated nap, not so big as a round little worm pricked from the lazy finger of a maid. A chariot is an empty hazelnut, made by the joiner squirrel or old grub, time out of mind the fairy's coachmakers and in this state she gallops night by night through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love, or courtiers' knees that dream on curtsies straight, or lawyers' fingers who straight dream on fees, or ladies' lips who straight on kisses dream, which oft the angry mab with blisters plagues, because their mouths with sweet meats tainted are. Sometimes she gallops over a courtier's nose, and then dreams he of smelling out a suit, and sometimes comes she with a tithe pig's tail, tickling a parson's nose as a lies asleep, then dreams he of another benefice. Sometime she driveth o'er a soldier's neck, and then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, of breeches, ambuscados, Spanish blades, of health five fathom deep, and then anon drums in his ear, at which he starts and wakes, and being thus frighted, swears a prayer or two, and sleeps again. This is that very mab that plats the manes of horses in the night, and bakes the elf-locks in foul sluttish hairs, which once untangled much misfortune bodes. This is the hag, when maids lie on their backs, that presses them, and learns them first to bear, making them women of good courage. This is she, End of Queen Mab from Romeo and Juliet Act One, Scene Four This recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Duke Orsino, Why Should I Not? From Twelfth Night Act Five, Scene One by William Shakespeare. Recorded for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman. Why should I not? Had I the heart to do it? Like to the Egyptian thief at point of death. Kill what I love. A savage jealousy that sometimes savors nobly. But hear me this. Since you to non-regardance cast my faith, and that I partly know the instrument that screws me from my true place in your favor? Live you, the marble-breasted tyrant still. But this, your minion, whom I know you love, and whom by heaven I swear I tender dearly, him will I tear out of that cruel eye, where he sits crowned in his master's spite. Come, boy, with me. My thoughts are ripe in mischief. I'll sacrifice the lamb that I do love, despite a raven's heart within a dove. End of Why Should I Not? From Twelfth Night. Act Five, Scene One. This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. From King Lear, Act One, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Carolyn Francis. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, nor more nor less. Good my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as are right fit, obey you, love you, and most honour you. Why have my sisters husbands, if they say they love you all? Haply, when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him half my care and duty. Sure I shall never marry like my sisters, to love my father all. End of Unhappy That I Am, I Cannot Heave My Heart Into My Mouth From King Lear, Act One, Scene One This recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org But I do think it is their husbands' faults. From Othello, Act 4, Scene 3, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. But I do think it is their husbands' faults if wives do fall. Say that they slack their duties, and pour our treasures into foreign laps, or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraint upon us. Or say they strike us, or scant our former having in despite. Why, we have galls, and though we have some grace, yet we have some revenge let husbands know their wives have sense like them they see and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour as husbands have what is it that they do when they change us for others is it sport i think it is and doth affection breed it I think it doth. Is it frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have not we affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well, else let them know the ills we do. Their ills instruct us so. End of But I Do Think It Is Their Husband's Faults From Othello, Act 4, Scene 3 This recording is in the public domain. If Music Be the Food of Love From Twelfth Night Act 1, Scene 1 By William Shakespeare Recorded for LibriVox.org By David Fetterman If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it, that surfeiting, the appetite may sicken and so die. That strain again, it had a dying fall. Oh, it came o'er my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odor. Enough, no more. It is not so sweet now as it was before. O oh, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, that notwithstanding thy capacity, receiveth as the sea, naught enters there. Of what validity and pitch sower, but falls into abatement and low price, even in a minute, so full of shapes is fancy, 
that it alone is high fantastical. End of If Music Be the Food of Love From Twelfth Night, Act One, Scene One This recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All the world's a stage, from As You Like It, Act Two, Scene Seven, by William Shakespeare, recorded for LibriVox.org, by David Fetterman. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women, merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts begin seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly, with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose, well saved a world too wide, for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice, turning again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. End of All the World's a Stage From As You Like It Act 2, Scene 7 this recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faith, Here It Is, from Romeo and Juliet, Act Three, Scene Five, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Faith, here it is. Romeo is banished, and all the world to nothing, that he dares ne'er come back to challenge you. Or if he do, it needs must be by stealth. Then since the case so stands as now it doth, I think it best you married with the county. Oh, he's a lovely gentleman. Romeo's a dishclout to him. An eagle, madam, hath not so green, so quick, so fair an eye as Paris hath. Beshrew my very heart, I think you are happy in this second match, for it excels your first. Or if it did not, your first is dead, or twere as good he were as living here, and you no use of him. End of Faith Here It Is From Romeo and Juliet Act Three, Scene Five This recording is in the public domain.